there's a lot of misconception about, about the Navajo tribe. A lot of it is because of the uh, the writings and the publications of archaeologists and anthropologists. Archaeologists are, have their minds set in stone. A lot of literature states that we came here to the southwest around 1200, 1300, 1400 AD. And they make it sound like we came from the Great Plains with no knowledge. No knowledge of ceremonial systems, no knowledge of the plants, no knowledge of the landscape, no knowledge of any kind of deities. And they they claim that we learned all our weaving from the Pueblos, from the Hobbies. They claim that we learned all our ceremonialism and our prayers and our chants and our even our mythology from the Puebloans and from the Hobbies and the Zunis. To me, I've been studying this for all my life. And I myself, I'm writing a, a history book on Navajo history, which is a totally different interpretation from a Navajo point of view rather than a white man's point of view. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books out there, but they're all written by a white man's point of view, which is totally false and totally wrong. They teach our kids the wrong way. They impart in our minds and embed in our minds misinformation. And so I'm out to prove that it's wrong because in our stories, in our own stories, in our own teachings, we talk about it, how we arrived here, how we got here. Nothing, there's not a single word, not a single suggestion saying that we came from the Bering Strait. Every archaeologist, every anthropologist say that we came from the Bering Strait. That's all Hable. It's wrong, it's not right. Our story said that we, we evolved here. We came from this area, we came from the lower worlds, emerging up here north of Durango, near Silverton in the uh, high alpine lakes is our emergence, our emergence area. And then we came down the valley, we became the people living in this area. And for me to think about it, when the Pueblos came among us, they came during seeking refuge, during the Pueblo revolt, during the, the time when the Spaniards attacked them and, and were, were genociding them. They came among the Navajos for several years, maybe a couple of months, maybe several years to, to seek out peace and shelter and refuge. During that time, those short visits, how in the hell are you gonna teach Navajos these very elaborate ceremonies? These elaborate ceremonies that take our own, our own people 20 years to learn. You know, some of these songs, some of these uh, like the, the Nightway chant, the, the mountaintop chants are nine, nine, nine day ceremonialism. And it, hundreds of songs, hundreds of prayers, dozens and dozens of sand paintings. There is no way we, we could have learned this from the Puebloans, from the Hopis. And at the same time, every ceremony has extensive stories that, that if you tell a story of the nightly chant, it's going to take a whole day. If you tell the story of the mountaintop chant, it's going to take a whole day. How can we have that extensive language, extensive Ceremonialism, extensive stories, all together, it's literally impossible for us to have learned it within a few short years from the Pueblos. So that's one main thing I like to get across. And then another thing is the name Anasazi, Nahasaza. You know, everywhere you see signs out here, Mesa's Rarity, Chaco, in the literature, in the archaeological professional papers, they say that Nahasaza means ancient enemies. In literal translation, it means ancient enemies. But we, Navajos, we did not call these ruins, these ancestral Pueblos, ancient enemies. We call them Nihizani, which means our grandmothers, Nihizani, which means our elders. And so the name, Nahasaza, it was given to Richard Wetherill. Richard Wetherill is like every archaeologist's hero. I call Richard Weather a grave robber and a pot hunter. And that was his specialty. He, he robbed graves and dug out dead corpses of uh, ancient Puebloans and he sold them. That's why the Weather brothers got chased out of Mesa Verde when it became a park because they literally looted like 40 to 50,000 articles and specimens of pottery and like even human, human uh, mummies. 
and they sold them, sold them to Sweden, sold them to Chicago, sold them to Denver. Richard Wetherill went down to Chaco Canyon. He, he built these training posts in his house right off the southwestern corner of Pueblo Benito. He used the rocks there from Pueblo Benito to build his home and his training post. So when he dealt with the Navajos, he would treat them badly and talk to them badly. The Navajos hated him from that region. They would say when he would come, he would see him coming, he would say, Chini, Chini, are na sana na So I would say, damn, damn, here comes that old devil enemy of ours. So when he heard that word, Nahasaza, and he heard it often because he didn't realize it was his nickname, his hated nickname. So when the first archaeological digs of North America started, when they came in from like Harvard, from Peabody, and uh, 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 Yale, UNM, Weatherall was, was placed in charge of some of the hill diggings. And at the time, he was telling these archaeologists that the Navajos were calling these sites Nahasaza. And once that word got into print, it, 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 the rest is history. We've been using that word ever since, saying Nahasaza, Nahasaza, the ancient enemies. We call them Nihizani, which means our grandmothers, Nihizana, which means our elders. And a lot of our stories come from there. Our, the, like for example, Chaco Canyon, the beadway, the Navajo beadway, the Navajo antway, the Navajo lightning way, part of our beadway comes from Chaco. Our, our part of our weaving stories come from Chaco. Mesa Verde, the Navajo Clint way, the Navajo Shiloh way chant came from the Temple of the Sun there at Mesa Verde. And they're closely tied with Chaco. They both worship and pray to the Navajo Black God. Mesa Verde was a society of black gods that walked down the hogback all the way down into Chaco. And so if you take the, the floor image of Pueblo Benito, it's a D-shape like this. You superimpose black gods mass on there, all the features will line up. And that's what's giving me an indication saying that the people of Chaco were worshippers of the Navajo black god. And the reason why we Navajos do not emulate the way the Puebloans live is because anything that goes bad, like a death in the house, we totally move away from the whole thing. We want nothing more to do with it. We don't go back. We don't try to take anything from it. When Chaco first started, it started among the salt people. It was the big gambler that came up from the Mayan, the Mayan deity that came up into Chaco and he took over playing games and di different kind types of games and he took everybody's soul away. And he won everybody's body, his soul, they became his slaves, they built these ruins. Every building there at Chaco Canyon has a Navajo name. Every building at Chaco Canyon has a Navajo story. There's a lot of rubble mounds, there's a lot of little cubby holes, little coves in the back, back part of the parks. Even the park service don't know about their significance. There are offering sites and there, there are prayers, there, there are places where certain, certain uh, events happen between the deities. So as a whole, the Navajos, we have more stories than the Pueblos or all the other like Hopi tribes, Zunis, when they talk about Chaco. You know, when you, when, you, when you ask them about Chaco, all they see is, all they say is there's a handprint on the wall. And when they see that handprint on the petroglyphs, they say that's where we migrated from. You know, which is good. But where, where are your stories, you know? Where's the detail as to how each building, what happened there? Why they were built, you know? And why Chaco fell, you know? So when, when, when Chaco fell, the big gambler was caught, they sent him down back to the full moon. And then later on, he was sent back to Mexico to become Quetzalcoatl again among the Toltecs and the Aztecs. And when you listen to the Toltecs and Aztecs stories, they talk about Quetzalcoatl coming from the full moon. Because we know is when we caught him, we, we sent him up to the full moon. Then one of our deities visited him, Biochiti. And he was the one that sent him back down to Mexico from the full moon. And that's why they, they connect the full moon with Quetzalcoatl and Kukulkan there in Mexico, South, uh, South America, and also Central America. So Chaco is the key to, to the Southwestern history. When, 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 he was, when the great camera was captured and uh, sent to the moon, Talking God came into, the, into that valley. He scolded out everybody. He got mad and scolded out everybody. 
tell them it's your own fault. You don't know when to say when to stop, when to say when. It's your vices that got you in trouble, that vices of gambling. And so he divided the people there in Chaco Valley. He gave them a choice if you want to return to the beauty way of life or retain the evil way of life that they just learned. So the whole tribe split up in half. The ones that wanted to return to the beauty way of life, the, the Navajo way, they got on the south side of Chaco Wash. The ones that didn't want to change, they were told to stay on the north side. And once they divided up like that, the ones on the north side were, were chased off. Lightning, hell, sleet, rain, wind. The, the holy people kept them on the move, make sure they didn't return, turn, turn around and go back. They were chased off all the way up into Canada. And once they got into Canada, that's what we call the Nenahotloni, the place where there are other Navajos. They have, they have six clans that are the same as Navajo clans down here. They have all the, the evil way stories, they have all the evil way uh, ceremonialism and the evil way uh, uh, chants. But they don't have any of the beauty way because that was taken away from them because they refused it down at Chaco. Us Navajos down here that remain down here, we still retain the beauty way and the evil way. So the evil way that they use up in Canada, we, we know down here. Their stories, their clans, the six clans, they originate from here. We still have them saying six clans down here in Navajo. So through that story, that's why I'm saying the Bering Strait is, is a big lie, you know. You know, it's, it's conjured up in there. They're trying to horse it on everybody. Like the big Bering Strait migration started 20,000 years. Why in the hell down in the southern tip of South America there at Patagonica are archaeological ruins that are 30,000 years, 10,000 years earlier than the supposed Bering Strait migration, you know? So 10,000 years before that, some people went all the way down to the southern tip of South America. So I'm um, basing my, my evidence on a lot of these cultural traditional tales and, and uh, even ceremonialism, like uh, even sand paintings. When you take a look at the big star chant, Sam Hayden system, you have Mother Earth and Father Sky. When you look at the rendition of that, it has the Milky Way, Polaris, it has all these different features. And then at the bottom, it has Polaris, Cassiopeia, and the Big Dipper. In the original Sam Hayden, the Big Dipper's tail is straight. Right now, the Big Dipper's tail is bent. So over time, the Big Dipper's tail it went from straight to being bent. So what we did, just out of our curiosity, we put that the modern day image of the Big Dipper on a program of stars and galaxies. We start reversing the time until that Big Dipper is tail straightened out. And when it straightened out, it was around about 1800 to 2000 BC is when it happened. So that's datable, saying that the big star chat was given to us during 1800 BC, you know. So that's the kind of evidence that I'm looking for right now to prove that we've been here for a very long time, you know.